We have um, a very special program this year. Um, this is the first year that we've ever offered this program free of charge to the public. And we were able to do that because of the very, very generous underwriting of our sponsors, who are all here. And we're very, very grateful. This is giving us an opportunity to provide this event to people at no charge and to really increase the access. So that's a, a huge accomplishment, especially now in our sixth year. We are honored to be joined this evening by the renowned cardiologist, Dr. Colleen Harrington. Dr. Harrington is a faculty member of the Women's Heart Health and Cardioobstetrics programs at Mass General Hospital. She's an associate program director of the MGH Cardiovascular Fellowship Program and also the current governor of the Massachusetts chapter of the American College of Cardiology. Her clinical and research interests include cardiovascular disease in women, cardioobstetrics, preventative cardiology, and non-invasive cardiovascular imaging. Aside from her professional achievements, or which were quite prestigious, um, Dr. Harrington and her husband, Jay, have 10-year-old twins, daughter Maya and son Rohan. And a few sort of fun facts about her. Um, she started Irish dancing, yes, the clogging thing, at the tender age of three, and she was a five-time regional and national champion. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, as part of this illustrious dancing career, she traveled with an all-female Irish group, and they performed for Shania Twain in a video and opened up for Hootie and the Blowfish. I mean, this is, like, amazing. Um, so with that, um, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Harrington to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa, um, for that very warm, and uh, it's a part of my life, uh, Irish dancing, um, that has really shaped who I am today. Um, my mother was born in Ireland, so it was a way of bringing that tradition um, to New York City, where I grew up. Um, before I start, I just want to say thank you um, for the sponsors. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Amy, for this warm, it's been an incredible experience since I got off the ferry yesterday. Um, really just honored to be with all of you as I share something I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, and my mission is to improve heart disease in women and men. I always say to my male patients, I care about you too. But we have a lot to do, you know, for women in cardiology and improving our outcomes and improving our experiences. So with that, I'm going to get started. It's going to be a little bit of true or false. You can participate or not. It's going to be a little bit of a Test your knowledge about where we are with heart disease. There's no test, there's no quiz. Um, just audience participation, I think, really makes it more fun. We're going to talk a little bit about how things are now, but we're going to end up with a call to action, and that includes all of us here in the room of what we can do for the future of women, our children, grandchildren. So let's just start out with statistics. Um, heart disease for men and women is the number one cause of death globally. And when we talk about heart disease, we're talking heart attacks, and we're talking about strokes. We do include that even as a cardiologist. I see patients with strokes. It's usually hand in hand sometimes with that cause. This is, it's, it's hard to hear this, but 18 million deaths annually by, from cardiovascular disease. And we're now seeing a trend is that it's occurring in patients less than 70 years old. This is global data. So the number one, top three causes of cardiovascular death is ischemic heart disease, which again, heart attack or stroke, hypertension, but 80% can be prevented. And this is the point of the program tonight, is to talk about what we can do to prevent these things from happening, working with our primary care providers and our advanced practice pr practitioners. So number one, is cardiovascular disease the number one cause of death for women? True or false? Yes, thank you. Not, I'm not happy about that, but... So this is data from The Lancet. The Lancet um, is really on a mission to improve global health for uh, women. So 35% of deaths in globally, um, are, are, sorry, globally for women are caused by cardiovascular disease. Almost 300 million were diagnosed with heart disease in 2019, and almost 9 million passed away from complications or from that event itself. And unfortunately, the mortality is increasing. So in that dotted, uh, that uh, solid green line is, is the U.S. female, 
the Canadian female is in that solid blue line. I won't go into the details of each graph, but I do want to show you the data. It's important that this is not Dr. Harrington's ideas. These are facts that we're seeing globally, nationally, and in Massachusetts. The only one that was a little bit had tailed off was the Australian female. And so the number one cause of death, again, cardiovascular disease. And if you look, it's more than number two, three, and four combined. Not that any of those are not important, absolutely. But the intention has to also be on cardiovascular health. And this is death from, i sorry, this is data from 2020 when early into the pandemic. And heart disease remains still number one with breast cancer being about 15% of cancer deaths, followed by COVID-19. Next one, heart attacks only occur, or usually occur, in postmenopausal women. True or false? So it's true, except, I know, that's a little bit, that's the case, it's true, but we are starting to see a trend. And this is data from France on the left and the US on the right-hand side. Data has shown from 2004 to 2014 that increasing uh, heart attacks about 6% in France and in women here on the right, less than 55 years old in the US, um, increased from 1995 to 2014, approximately from 21 to 31%. So we're starting to see this, and I see this at MGH. We are starting to see women so the, yes, the majority tend to be postmenopausal, but we are starting to see a trend towards younger women. Number three, the most common cause, or sorry, symptom when a woman having a heart attack is shortness of breath. False, that's right. And you guys are doing great. I don't even, why am I here? <laughs> so the reason I bring this up is also because I think it's important to talk about where the data is coming from. And there was a lot in the media and news that I was hearing is that shortness of breath and shortness of breath. And yes, women can present with shortness of breath, but by and large, they'll present with chest pain, pressure, or heaviness. So you're all right. Yes, men tend to have classical symptoms of chest pain or pressure or heaviness, but women still are more likely to present with chest pain or pressure. However, as I teach my fellows and my medical students, you also have to not ignore the symptoms that are not typical, like shortness of breath, upper back pain, epigastric pain, fatigue. I have women that come see me with fatigue. That can be a whole lot of things, but you have to think about it because I tell them, if you don't think about it, you're gonna miss it. I love this one. The underlying causes of a heart attack are the same for men and women. So, right, that's true. I mean, it's, that's true and that's false. <laughs> so by and large, when people say, what causes a heart attack? You know, I spend a lot of time in my office just going and explaining, drawing pictures to my patients so they can understand what is a heart attack. Well, in general, for men and women, it tends to be a cholesterol buildup over time. And then something happens, reasons we're not sure, and that narrowing becomes even more narrowed, and then the blood flow to that heart muscle is diminished. It's usually something called a plaque rupture that can be from high blood pressure. It can be people getting into arguments. So there's still like an adrenaline rush. There's a, a lot of things we don't understand why things go from not so tight to very tight. So by and large for men and women, that is the most common cause of underlying heart attack but we are seeing much more uncommon reasons for women having heart attacks. So they can have blood clots or embolism, so they don't have that cholesterol buildup. This one always comes out around Valentine's Day. On the right-hand side, you have something called Takasubu or stress cardiomyopathy, the broken heart syndrome. And they all, the media loves this on Valentine's Day. And we see this in women, most commonly postmenopausal women who get or experience a physical or emotional stressor, extreme, the loss of a loved one, car accident, and there's a stunning of the heart that leads to a heart attack. 90% are in women. This one of, I am very proud to be on the team at MGH of this SCAD or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. There is no clot, there is no plaque, there is a small tear in the artery. This has been missed for 20 years and plus, and we see this in pregnancy, and we see it perimenopausal. And we have so much more to learn because there's clearly a hormonal aspect here. And I just, and I share 
with the permission of a patient who was six weeks postpartum, and this exactly was the cause of her heart attack. So there are different risk factors for men and women for heart disease, true or false? Oh, no, that came out too soon. Oh, OK, true. Um, my kids would crack up at me right now. Mom, you didn't put the animation on time. So as one of the cardioobstetrics team members, we now know that women here on the, right, on the left-hand side who do experience pregnancy complications, we used to think they had the baby, everybody's focusing on the baby, mom's fine. And now we realize that if you've had an adverse pregnancy outcome, such as gestational diabetes or hypertension, your risk is later on in life higher than those women who did not. We know that autoimmune conditions like lupus are more common in women, so those are sex-specific risk factors. Postmenopausal status, hormonal status, and some cancer treatments. We know that chemotherapy, particularly for breast cancer, have an increased risk for heart um, uh, damage. So let's talk a little bit about pregnancy complications. So women who have high blood pressure, diabetes, if their babies are smaller than what would be expected, we know that later on in life, we have to, we have to screen them, we have to be more aggressive with decreasing their cardiovascular disease. Why? Because unfortunately, maternal mortality is increasing in the US, has the highest maternal mortality than any industrialized country in the world. It breaks my heart. Because as I said on that first slide, or second slide, almost 80% of those can be prevented, and that's hence why we're here. Number one cause of maternal death, heart. Real story, I don't know if anybody uh, recognizes, Tori uh, Bowie was a US uh, athlete, a gold medalist for track and field, died earlier this year from complications of eclampsia or high blood pressure during pregnancy, and she was about seven months pregnant. And so, and that's the other statistic that we're seeing here, is that here on your left-hand side is your total mortality. So 33, this is 33 per 100,000 live births. So that's all on your left-hand side of women who, who deliver in the US will die in pregnancy. If we look at non-Hispanic black, it's 70 per 100,000, and higher in Hispanic followed by non-Hispanic white. On the right-hand side is then the data from the same time frame from 2018 to 2020 by age. And if you're a woman over the age of 40 in this country, your risk of a, is about 140 per 100,000 live births of not surviving that pregnancy. It's astounding, right? I mean, I think and I bring this up not to be the Debbie Downer of the night. This is that we, we can do better. We definitely can say, we can give better treatment to our women and follow along. And this is some data we've published at MGH, is that women who have adverse pregnancy outcomes will have a higher risk of heart disease later on in life. Now we're actually seeing that their fetuses or their offspring have an increased risk of having a heart attack, high blood pressure, and stroke. What about menopausal status? It, it, it matters. And so women, I'll show you data, who have surgical or menopause that's considered before the age of 40, um, naturally will have an increased risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. Oh my God, Dr. Harrington, this is, but all three of these can be prevented. It's not like we don't have amazing medications and amazing providers here on Nantucket, Boston, wherever. All of these can be prevented. The point is that we acknowledge it, and then we can, take, we can tackle it. And so it's time that when women come and see uh, their primary care physicians and cardiologists, that we use these sex-specific risk factors, because all everyone here in the audience is different. Everyone had, some had multiple pregnancies. Some had one, some had none. Family history, we are all so different. And so it's important that that individualized care takes that into consideration. Okay, awareness, like programs like this, which is incredible. Um, so do you think that heart awareness is increasing in women or true or false? Is it increasing? No, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but with programs like this, um, so yeah, overall about 55% of women 
who were um, surveyed by the American Heart Association were not aware that heart disease was their leading cause of death. And we are definitely seeing a decrease in that acknowledgement in minorities, uh, black and Hispanic minorities. And it's declining. And we're seeing this again in that same population, of, uh, particularly in Hispanic and non-Hispanic black, but also younger women, where we have the biggest impact in preventing lifelong heart disease. And the physicians too. Uh, so this is where programs like this programs across the country are going to make an impact of increasing that awareness. And so, and what I'm doing at MGH with our fellows, increasing training of training of heart disease in women and being comfortable taking care of a woman who's pregnant who has heart condition. This is one of my missions. And all of us, you know, together, we will, we will make an impact. But now we have all this amazing clinical trials. I didn't go into the details of each graph, but now at least you know, the NIH mandated several years back that women have to represent 50% of all participants in, in clinical trials. Do you think that's true or false? No, I know. I know, but we're getting better. So there's studies that just came out from the American Heart Association, where we're now seeing 50% of women participating in that research, um, 47, we're getting there. And it's because we're making a point that we need to be at the table. We have to be there. We are extrapolating data, and sorry for the men in the room, but from, from studies that were done with all men. And we know we're not the same. And so unfortunately, the statistics were not great in this time frame, so less than 31%, but we're doing better. So it limits our sex-specific strategies. As I said, we are all different. We all come from different backgrounds and different risk factors. That's why women involved in clinical research is so important. Now you go in and you have a heart attack, do you receive the same treatment as men? Yeah. No. It's important to know that this, again, is not Dr. Harrington coming up with these PowerPoint slides. This is the data. This is a young heart attack study, so all the patients in this study were less than 50 years old. And I, I didn't highlight this, but again, it showed most are going to present with chest pain or pressure. But 81% in this trial were men, but women did not receive the same treatment. They didn't, were less likely to get the medications. This doesn't happen every day. But it's something we need to be aware of. Women are less likely to get the same medications when they have a heart attack or less offered to have a stent placed. And do they have the same outcomes? I think we know no. They're more likely not to survive that heart attack or develop heart failure. And something that came up last night, oh, I should go back. And they were less likely to be seen by a cardiologist, which breaks my heart in a way a million pieces as being a female cardiologist, which only is about 12 to 13% of US cardiologists. But again, we're getting there. But women are more likely to have psychological impact from that heart attack. And we talked about that last night. We need to dive deeper into that. But even more importantly, we need to provide the resources for those women and men, of course, but we have data to say that they're more likely to be impacted. And I can tell you that from a clinical experience, it's true. So it's a call to action. St programs like this, raising awareness, engage communities. I mean, this, this is why, yes, daunting. I, I don't like it. I, I wish the data was better. I can't change the data. But now it's a call to action. What can we do? And it's programs like this that are just such a huge step. Know your risk. Talk to your medical team, your primary care physician, your advanced practice uh, practitioners. They're amazing. They're so knowledgeable. Just have a conversation about you, not all everyone else, but your concerns, your risk factors. They want to know your family history. Do you have these traditional risk factors? Do you smoke cigarettes? Are you overweight? Do you have high cholesterol? Do you have diabetes, high blood pressure? Other than your genetics, we can treat all of these things. We just have to start the conversation. 
Know your cholesterol levels. If you go home and think about, oh my goodness, that was depressing. I, what are we gonna do? Um, know your cholesterol levels. I think every, every patient, man or woman, should know at least a, an idea of your cholesterol level. Um, ideally, in a total cholesterol less than 200 and an LDL cholesterol less than 100 and an HDL, which is that good cholesterol, over 60. Know your blood pressure. I tell a lot of my patients, and I obviously I'm biased, I see heart disease patients. I love it when I see the, pre the prevention patients. So I ask them to check your blood pressure in between the visits. Know what your blood pressure is. You know, when you go in for anything, you know, and I have a month, I have patients, my teachers are the best. They come in with tabs of blood pressures, graphs and everything. I know exactly what's going on, and I know what is, are we perfect, or do we need to do a little fine tuning? Because one data point, as we know, and 50 data points is a whole different thing. There's something you can talk to your providers about a risk calculator. This has been validated from, by the ACC. I won't go into the details. It will give you a general idea of your risk. Maintaining and trying to maintain a normal body mass index we, there's some criticism clearly in this is that it's not perfect. It's a goal to try to, if you're above your BMI goal, is to try to bring that down. There's a lot of criticism in there, but there is correlation with higher BMI and heart disease. I always get asked the pear and the apple. The waist circumference does matter. You know, um, adiposity or adipose tissue in, in your stomach area has a different characteristics than fat seen elsewhere. And so um, when my patients in the office, I measure their waist um, as part of my initial vital signs. And this, for the sake of time, these are now, so we talked about those traditional risk factors, the ones that you know about. These are now getting into the nitty gritty of you as a patient. Do you have a family history? Do you have kidney problems? Do you have early menopause? That's why I brought up that slide earlier. Um, we now are seeing South Asian populations, and there's grants now studying this, that we are seeing a higher prevalence of heart disease in that ethnicity. So a call to action. So you want to optimize your prevention and clinical care. So if anybody smokes or even vaping, there's data here now that it increases heart disease. Smoking has been, has been known for some time now. It's probably the best thing that you could do right now to decrease your cardiovascular health, to increase your, uh, sorry, improve your cardiovascular health. How can I lose weight? People ask me this all the time. I'm going to be honest, I'm not, I'm not into the fad diet. I think the old try and true, um, understanding you. I have patients coming in and say, I want to lose 50 pounds this year. I'm like, OK, let's start at 10, and then we can slowly get up, because I don't want them to get discouraged. I certainly also see a, it's not just myth. Postmenopausal women have a tough time losing weight and coming up with different strategies about how to get them to the, get the goal that they would want to be at. I say, I love one of my friends who's a nutritionist, nutritionist. she's like, paint your, your plates with full of colors and not Skittles, as my kids would say. Um, with healthy foods, it's a way of trying to remember at every snack, try to eat healthy, non-processed foods, not only for the heart benefits, but we know they have anti-inflammatory benefits as well. I get this all the time. So the reasons I put these up are these are my, the ones that my patients ask me the most. So in general, the American Heart Association says we should all be doing moderate intensity aerobic activity 30 minutes, five days a week. Biking, jog walking. Walking is the easiest thing and the way to start. But, you know, varying it up, biking, rowing, really whatever, depending on if you've got orthopedic issues. Um, and then starting, I have them start the aerobics usually first, and then we gradually start to do a little bit of weight training. Um, and then um, increasing that over time. I get this one all the time. So is alcohol good for my heart? And this is like the coffee and the eggs, right? It's bad, it's good, it's bad, it's good. Um, they, they do have some flavonoids and antioxidants, but we all know the harmful effects of alcohol. So to be, you know, my heart patient's was discharging one who had a heart attack. He's like, I can't have red wine, right? He said in front of his wife. I said, well, you know, the American heart says two glasses. So um, 
we know that regular exercise and eating healthy actually already gives you those benefits. So you're going to hear a lot of back and forth with that one. What about stress? Well, we all know with the COVID pandemic and the stress, and we've started not only seeing mental health, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but we also started to see people, and I said this last night, you know, fall out of those bad habits of exercising and eating, right? For all the reasons of what the stress that we were under and the unknown and that scariness. But mental health, it's a big part of cardiovascular disease. We know that there's depression after heart attacks, I just showed you data that that's more enhanced in women, which is why we're lucky enough in our Women's Heart Health Program to recently now have a therapist on staff that's now seeing our patients. I mean, we were, I was just on a call this morning, like she's starting in September and we are ecstatic and over the moon to be able to deliver that comprehensive care to women who need it because there are health benefits to a good mental attitude. We know they have lower sugar levels, less inflammation, their blood pressure is lower. All those things that I said that we can prevent. So women's heart health programs like the one I'm in, the primary care physicians that you have here on the island who I work with, I share so many patients with the MPs and PAs as well as the MDs. You know, this, this is the role of a patient-centered focus on heart disease. And I'm proud to be part of the Women's Heart Health Program that not only raises awareness and engaged communities, which we've already talked about, we've talked about optimization and prevention of clinical care, but research. We need the research. We need to advocate. I told folks, I go to Ledge Conference, I go to Capitol Hill every year to fight for my patients. I'm not trying to say I'm a martyr, but it's part of the whole action is that we need, I've, we got a bill passed for more research in women with valvular heart disease, extending care for women after they deliver for postpartum care to extend for that one year after, and then monitoring progress. And that's why women's heart health programs and programs like you have here are just so important in order to increase awareness, increase at, uh, engagement, if possible, start research, advocacy, and then monitor the progress. How are we doing? We're doing great here. We need to do more in this area. It is one of the oldest programs in the country, uh, founded by my true mentors and friends, Dr. Melissa Wood and Dr. Nandita Scott. And we've seen over 6,000 women since it's been started. And we are starting to see this complexity and acuity and seeing these conditions that were missed, like this uh, dissection, which I know is a scary word, but that was, that was not even known to cause heart attacks 20 years ago. And now we know, and now we have data to treat it. And now we're treating women you know, with all different uh, cardiovascular conditions at all points of their life, not just menopausal, young in prevention, pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, all of that. It's all part of the same circle. So I'm gonna final, I hope I did well on time. Um, maybe a little bit over, sorry. So to take home is cardiovascular disease for men and women is the number one cause of death. The increasing awareness like programs like this is so essential and understanding that we do have some traditional risk factors that we share with men, but there's clearly sex specific risk factors that are different. So optimizing care includes that partnership that I talked about multiple times with communities, academic community centers in order to address those sex and gender specific disparities in cardiac outcomes. And programs like this that we have at MGH that we're, and all of the wonderful things that's doing at Nantucket Cottage Hospital, we can identify these risk factors and most importantly, we can treat them. And so I want you to leave with that note that everything that we talked about, we can't change your genes yet, but I'm sure that's gonna happen one day. Any of those things, even if you're sitting there and you have them, they can be prevented, they can be treated. It's just start the conversation with your provider is the first step to go. With that, I want to say thank you. It's really just been an honor. So I think we have time for a few questions. Hi, the presentation was amazing and thank I thank you so much oh, for raising you. everyone's awareness. 
Um, if we go to our physician, what should we ask them that we're you know, not doing? And I also know that like every guy I know is on the staff. And I don't know a single woman on one, so. Okay, I know a single woman on one, but anyway, I think that it seems to be much more prevalent among men. I mean, just oh, it's, the it's, idea of prescribing. So those are a great point and a great question. Um, I'll start out with um, knowing when you, when you meet with your physician, APP and nurse practitioner, PA, um, and knowing those things that we talked about, they do weigh you. So unless you, know, you can calculate your body mass index on your own with the online calculators, what's my blood pressure? Have we checked my cholesterol? They're, I mean, they're so good, they probably have. Have they screened you for diabetes? Are you at risk for diabetes? And so even just starting out with knowing those, do you smoke? You know, what's your family history? And then as I teach my fellows, which is a little bit crazy in cardiology, get their OB history. What do they have? And so it's learning those risk factors. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have preeclampsia that you're guaranteed to have a heart problem later in life. It's just that we have to watch you closely. So I would say just starting out with those basic traditional risk factors and knowing that um, these are labs that are sent all the time and they're very easy to get. With your statin question that, as you can see from the smile on my face, we do have data that women are less offered a statin when they need it. And not every woman I see, I do a lot of lifestyle first unless it's very high risk meaning um, they're, at, they're at a high risk for heart disease. And then the American College of Cardiology is very specific with the guidelines that, yes, you will benefit from a statin. But a study came out earlier this year, I didn't put it in for the sake of time, that women are less offered a statin, but they're all also less likely to take a statin. And so um, I just was in clinic in Boston on Wednesday, and most of my visit was talking to this woman about what she had heard about statins, because um, every medication has side effect. And I just presented her the data. And then, and I never say, oh, we have to decide today. You go home, you think about it, here's the data. But to answer your question or bring up your point, women are declining statins, but they're being offered it less. And so, again, two, thing, two things that we can make a big impact and, and just getting the word out. And for you to, do, would I benefit from a statin? No, actually your risk is only one to 2%. Okay, then you know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Jeff, you yeah. wanna take one over there? So when I turned, oh, yes. so when I turned, oh gosh, the calcium kind of score. scary. I yeah. might have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a doctor. I said, I'll, I'll take care of you. <laughs> um, okay, so when I, my doctor score. had me go to, a, she had my, my husband and myself both go to a cardiologist. We don't have high risk factors, but she uh -huh. wanted a baseline for yeah. us. And then we did the cardiac cat oh, score. Yep. And then within that, they broke down the plaque and what kind of plaque there was, but mm -hmm. you can have that test, in, at least in North Carolina, in February for $90. Yes, that's right. Most, do you think it's, because that's heart month, do you so think that's an effective test? Screening or? test. Yeah. It, this is, I could, uh, you see the smile, I could talk about this from now until one in the morning. <laughs> I, I, and this is what I just love. So the calcium score, so for folks in the audience, so when you build up plaque in the arteries, it becomes calcified, and that can be detected on a CAT scan. And then the reader, which I am one, you can calculate the volume. I won't go into the science, but it'll tell you, do you have any calcium or not? And then if you do, how much do you have? And then they can actually give you your percentile to age and gender match controls of you know, patients with the same race, ethnicity, um, and age, and sex. So the thing about the calcium score for most of the patients that I see in the office, which I'm obviously skewed towards, is that they're already on a statin, which is the therapy if you have a high calcium score, usually over 100. So when you're already on the, on the medication that you should be and your cholesterol is controlled, and I would say for those patients, I'm more aggressive of lowering that LDL cholesterol to less than 70 as opposed to less than 100, it's not really gonna change management unless the patient really wants to know. Because if in cardiology, if the patient's not having symptoms and they're biking from here to Nantucket Hospital with no symptoms, no one is going to catheter, put a stent in that patient. Stents are for symptoms, not just for things that we find. Where I think the calcium score really aids 
um, in the conversation is the women, and I, I don't mean to stereotype, this is my clinical experience. The women are like, I don't think I wanna be on a statin. And so we do a calcium score, and if their calcium score is really high, I show them the images and it aids in that conversation. That's the other thing I, meant, I should mention about the calculator. I do the calculator in front of the patient. I try to make it as interactive as possible. I show them their own echoes. I show them their catheterizations. And then I punch in the numbers. And it's, again, not me. The number spits out. And then we have a really good conversation. And them seeing that part of the process, I think, really engages them and really helps in the conversation. So the calcium score has a role. Should everyone get it? It's not considered a screening test yet. It can aid in the conversation, but as I tell my fellows and my med students, are you gonna order a test that has to change your management because there is some radiation um, and other tests can be invasive, not that one. And so for me, it's just where I trained. If it's not gonna change my management to put the patient through a test that's not gonna change, I'm a little bit hesitant. If the patient says, I really wanna know, I'll do it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. A key theme of this um, program today is about access to care and access to information. And we are really delighted that we have Cynthia Winston, who is our VP of, at, at NCHR, the Nantica Cottage Hospital VP of Community Medicine um, with us this evening. And she's going to be moderating a panel with five of our nurse practitioners, um, who I will introduce in just a moment. And I'm quite sure that you will leave um, this conversation not only feeling better informed, but also very uh, much better cared for as well. Um, we have sort of a um, dating game situation here with these <laughs> chairs. Um, so would you please join me in welcoming to the stage Cynthia Winston, Annette Adams, Claire Conklin, Molly Harding, Deborah Moss Gale, and Katie Miller, thank you. I wanna take a minute and thank Lisa and the other members of the committee for inviting us here today and to give a little bit of a background on primary care at Nantucket Cottage Hospital. We have five of our nurse practitioners here who have primary care panels and see patients, but we also have three physicians, Drs. Pearl, Kame, and Andy Yu. And we also have a part-time nurse practitioner, Nancy Lucchini, who practices with um, these five. And we have Jane Calkins, who's a physician assistant who works full time in our urgent access clinic. So she's supporting the, the primary care providers by seeing their patients when they need to see someone quickly. So I think maybe the way we'll start is have people introduce themselves. We start with you, Annette. Is this one? Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Annette Adams, um, and I'm an adult gerontology nurse practitioner. Um, and I work with the internal medicine group in the primary care offices. Um, I became a nurse um, over 25 years ago. I graduated nursing school in uh, 1995 uh, from a small nursing college in Indiana, um, Health Professions College, uh, with my associate's degree and then got my bachelor's degree on that. Um, and then um, I started uh, working primarily in the hospitals and traveled across the country and that brought me to Nantucket. Um, I, this was my last travel assignment in 2007. Um, and I worked uh, in the inpatient unit here at the hospital for you know, you know, many years um, and decided to go back to school to get my master's um, and went to an online university, um, Walden University, um, and was able to do my practicums here in the, in the hospital and in and around the offices here. Um, and I became, um, I started working as um, a nurse practitioner in the offices in 2016, so. Sorry. <laughs> Claire? Hi, I'm Claire Conklin. I'm a family nurse practitioner with um, special interest in women's health and prenatal care as well, but I see um, all members of the family. Um, I've been a nurse for 10 years, graduated from Boston College, and then got a master's degree from Marymount University in Virginia. Um, I moved up here to Nantucket about a year ago, last May, uh, from Washington, D.C., and I can now officially call myself a year-round resident. <laughs> Hi, my name is Molly Harding. I am a family nurse practitioner here, and I um, have been on Nantucket year-round for 18 years as of June. 
I uh, have a Bachelor of Arts first, and then I went on and got a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing at Columbia. And I got a master's degree, um, when did I get that? In 2019 at Regis. And I've been working as a nurse here at Nantucket Cottage Hospital for 15 years and as a nurse practitioner for three years. My name is, oh, are we on? My name is Deborah Moscale. Um, I am also a family nurse practitioner. Uh, my background, I actually have been a nurse practitioner for 15 years, <laughs> almost 15 years. Um, and um, my background, I knew I wanted to be a nurse practitioner. I started out studying sociology and actually had some experiences in parts of the world where there's really limited access to care in uh, Thailand and, uh, and, and some other places and realized I really wanted to uh, contribute in a sort of a very practical way. So I became a nurse and pretty rapidly became a nurse practitioner. And um, one of my passions is really uh, serving those who don't have great access to care, which is an interesting dynamic here because we kind of um, are, are 30 miles out to sea. And so I've been here for the past two years. I speak Spanish, so a lot of my patients um, are, are Spanish speaking. And that's kind of been a really neat kind of niche um, to, to find myself in here. And um, it's just been a joy to kind of get to know the different ways that you have to be creative here on the island um, when doing primary care. Hi, I'm Katie Miller. I'm one of the family nurse practitioners here. I moved to Nantucket about a year ago um, for this primary care position. I um, got my nursing education back in the Rochester, New York area. Um, I graduated from nursing school in 2009. I worked primarily in the hospital setting, um, medical surgical nursing, and then in the emergency department while I pursued my master's degree. Um, I've been a nurse practitioner back in Rochester. I worked um, in hospitalist medicine and then transitioned more to the primary care um, field, which is where I've been working here for the last year, and I can't imagine living anywhere else. Thank you all. I just want to say Deborah was tentative on our list for today, so, but she's, she's looking pretty awesome, isn't she? Um, so as a follow-up, can you talk a little bit about your training, Annette? What was your training like when you became, when you did your NP training? Um, so, um, like I said, my um, history is with, um, in the hospital. Um, so I did a lot of my uh, clinicals, I did actually all of my clinicals here on Nantucket um, with um, adult population um, in the adult uh, gerontology nurse practitioner in Dr. Lepre's office, Laura Codio graves um, and with other um, primary care doctors around the, uh, around the island. Um, so it was a uh, good experience um, with clinics and in the doctor's office. Claire, I know you had an interesting interaction that sort of led you to your NP decision. Do you want to talk about that? So when I was um, younger, kind of discerning my career path, I had a really formative conversation with a physician who was a family friend, and um, we were talking about different options in healthcare. And um, when he was kind of telling me about nursing and his perception of nurses was that um, nurses are all about caring for the whole person. and. Um, nurse practitioners caring for the patient, the family, really learning about the so, psych psychosocial dynamic um, of a patient. And I just really, really felt drawn to that idea of caring for the whole person and the Jesuit um, a tradition of cure personalis that I kind of followed at Boston College and Georgetown. And um, that's, I think, why we're all here is that we love to care for the whole person, the whole family, and, and our island community. Deborah, can you talk a little bit about the difference between primary care that's provided by a physician and the type of care that you provide? And what is the difference? In some ways, it's very similar. In some ways, it, it, you know, what a physician might do um, and what a nurse practitioner might do in the office. You know, we often order the same tests. We often, um, you know, might might kind of go through the same conversations. I think. 
and, and we might even have different scopes of practice based on our experience, our background, what we like to do, um, you know, what we're good at. And, uh, and I would say there's no doubt that a physician's training is usually a little bit more comprehensive. Uh, it, you know, it, I have lots of friends who are, who are doctors who, you know, kind of had different experiences in their education. Um, but when it comes down to kind of the nitty gritty in the, in the office, I think a lot of times what we do is very similar. And the underlying, I think the care of the whole person is in some ways where I think the difference is. Um, and I once worked in a practice where I had a, an amazing collaborative, collaborating physician who was just so brilliant. Um, and I used to think, wow, the same patient might be assigned to me as a primary care provider as to him. Um, and then I, I began to see that one of the things that nurse practitioners often bring is an approachability because we are nurses too. And so patients would sometimes ask me questions that they might not have asked him. Um, and so kind of realizing that that is sort of a, a special thing that nurse practitioners often bring in primary care. Um, and, you know, there's a range of people and personalities in any profession, but I think that sort of care of the whole person and some of that awareness is something that as nurses we can't quite get away from, and it's a good thing. So we at Nantucket Cottage Hospital were a pilot site for something called Full Practice Authority. Um, we did the pilot for Mass General Brigham. Molly, do you want to talk a little bit about what that means? So that's a, it's a pretty exciting change for us as nurse practitioners. Massachusetts was the last state in New England to allow nurse practitioners to practice independently. Um, and it was pretty exciting when I heard um, from Jeanette Ives Erickson, our, our former CEO, that she was going to have Nantucket be the first hospital in the Mass General System to start this, right? The first in the Mass General System. Second in the state, first in the Mass General System, I think. Um, so um, we've done that, and that's pretty exciting for us. The only difference in our practice is that we could, in theory, go out and practice independently. It does not change the way we approach our patients. Um, it means that we do not have a doctor supervising us anymore, where, as before, a doctor's name appeared on our prescriptions and our test, our test orders. So when the nurse practitioners introduce themselves, some of them are family practice um, nurse practitioners, and Annette is our internal medicine and um, geriatric medicine nurse practitioner. Who wants to talk about the difference in family practice? And Claire, I think you were gonna talk a little bit about family practice. Um, I mean, the, the largest, most obvious difference is just our our training and our kind of specialty when we were going through our master's programs. Um, Annette's focus was only on um, men and women 14 or 14 and up. And for us over here, we see um, babies, adults, grandparents. I think the term is womb to tomb is like <laughs> is what we like to say. So we can see everybody provide OB care, provide care to, to everybody across the lifespan. Why is it important to have a PCP and to see them regularly? Who wants to, uh, Molly? Oh, Annette, let's, let's have Annette take that one. Um, so um, a PCP um, helps to coordinate you know, all of your screening tests. Um, she, they are like, kind of like the quarterback of the, of the healthcare um, team. Um, she's kind of like your go-to person, um, health screenings for your chronic diseases. Um, we really do a little bit of everything. Um, sometimes there are more challenging cases and we do, you know, refer out to specialists, but a lot of times a primary care doctor can, can pretty much take care of a lot of different things. Um, and also it's a person to come back to, um, you know, you were in the hospital, you had, you know, it's a person to follow up with, um, making sure that you're recovering well um, after you were in the hospital or an ER visit or a urgent care visit, um, making sure that you are recovering and that you're getting back to your baseline. Um, and, and we help to kind of monitor all of that. I was just going to mention screenings and a lot of the reason that we all went into primary care is to be that first person that um, can person who helps to coordinate prevention and preventative care. So doing things like cholesterol screenings, blood pressure screenings, um, and then cancer screenings like mammograms, bone density scans. Um, all of that is really 
a large part of primary care and why you go in for your physical exams or health maintenance exams to stay ahead of things before you need urgent care. Um, and that's, that's the goal of, of primary care really is prevention. Katie, can we talk a little bit about the urgent access clinic and the, the care that is provided there for the patients who not only are here for the summer or are here visiting, but who are our primary care patients? Hello? Okay. So the Urgent Access Clinic um, serves kind of a, like a same day clinic for um, urgent kind of minor injuries and illnesses. Um, we have more providers on during the summer when we have, you know, a higher population, obviously. Um, so we've been seeing between like 40 to 50 patients a day. Um, patients can schedule visits usually the night before or the morning of. Um, this summer, we've been seeing a lot of upper respiratory infections, tick bites. Um, that's um, that's primarily what the what the urgent access clinic is. And um, as Cynthia mentioned, we see people. It is open year round, um, so we see year round seasonal residents, and then plenty of vacationers too. And we do have weekend, uh, yeah. we, we add, when we open for the summer, we add Saturday and Sunday hours as well. So it's been pretty popular. Um, Nantucket Cottage Hospital Ambulatory Clinic is licensed as a rural health clinic. And I know that it, it, feel, it doesn't feel super rural here, except for the fact that we are 30 miles out at sea, which we all love. Um, but what does, what does that mean and what's different about being, um, providing care in a rural health clinic? Go ahead, Deborah. <laughs> sure. the, the, the creativity that I mentioned comes yeah. into play here sometimes. Um, so I, I previously worked uh, as a primary care provider in Philadelphia. Um, and you know, in Philadelphia, there are multiple health systems. And if I want to send an adult to see an ENT, I have maybe you know, 18 options, and you know, it might be based on where the patient lives, or their insurance, or you know, what health system they have most of their care from. Here, we have a couple of choices. We have a pediatric ENT who will sometimes make exceptions to see adults. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Malone. <laughs> um, we have, we have, uh, you know, we can send someone to Hyannis, who, you know, to see an ENT there, and that involves the cost and the time of travel, and, you know, maybe someone might want to go to Boston, or, you know, they might, they might say, you know what, I can wait on this, and when I, when I go back to whatever other location that I live live at other times of the year, I'll follow up on that. But um, the other thing we might do is we might do more here as a primary care provider than you might somewhere else. Because honestly, we don't have this sort of roster of available options to send a patient to. So, you know, I, I had a patient who had some irregular heartbeats and, you know, I made sure they got the Holter monitor and looked at the electrolytes and kind of did a bunch of things that I wouldn't necessarily have done if I had a cardiologist who is there full time that I could just say, hey, could you prioritize this patient? They're having really frequent PVCs. Um, and so I, and, and so some of the care limitations and the delays and getting people in just requires more creativity and honestly makes us probably better clinicians because we have to do more than we might otherwise. And that's not all that being working in a rural area means, but here that's kind of what it, what it means to me. Claire, did you wanna? Just gonna add another little spin on that, that um, something that I do really love about working here is that we have the community and you really get to know your patients and you see them out and around. But um, if we do have a question, we have access to a huge, huge, um, network of physicians through Mass General Brigham, and there's this amazing tool called eConsult where we can send your chart and send your information with a specific clinical question to a doctor. They will read it, they'll get back to us in a couple days or even that same day and tell us exactly what their recommendation is and how we need to proceed. Whether that's us ordering some tests here on Nantucket, doing imaging, 
Um, or are we getting you up to Boston to get an appointment? Um, we're waiting for one of our specialists to come down from Mass General. So I feel very lucky to be a part of this network where we can take care of our own really well, but also have a really, really great connection to one of the best hospital systems. I know that when we talk about specialists, sometimes people get nervous. What if I see a specialist? Is my primary care provider gonna know what changes were made? And we hear the word fragmentation of care. Molly, do you wanna talk a little bit about why we don't worry as much here as we might? Um, fragmentation of care is a problem nationwide in healthcare, I think. It's, um, you know, I saw one doctor, but my primary care doesn't know what that specialist did or ordered, and the patient might not know, and what dose are you taking, and when are you due for a follow-up, and sometimes those records don't get to your primary care, and um, it's very confusing and fragmented, and, and can sometimes result in error or um, some bad outcomes. The, convenient thing for us is that we have a um, medical record system that is used by many hospital systems and um, can pull information in from other places. In particular, we, because we're part of the Mass General System, any specialist that does documentation in that system will automatically show up in, in the chart and we all have access to that here. So that's a really nice benefit. Can someone talk about gateway for one minute, patient gateway? Mm. I know that every one of you, all of you saw the reaction. We love patient gateway, but. <laughs> patient gateway is wonderful and it is the way of the future for better or for worse. Um, nobody seems to really like waiting on hold and waiting to talk to a human and going through the phone tree and leaving a message and waiting for your nurse to call back and all that. Um, the, the most convenient way is to use that little app on your phone called the Patient Gateway and make sure it's Face ID enabled so you don't have to remember your password. <laughs> that being said, um, it is not to be used for urgent issues. For example, I think I'm having a stroke, what should I do? things like that. But it is great for, hey, I found this new mole. You know, Do you think it looks bad? What should I do? Or I've been checking my blood pressure at home and I don't like the numbers. What do you think? Those are all very appropriate and a good use of that. Thank you, Molly. So don't send emergent messages on Gateway. I also, Molly mentioned the nurses. A lot of times if you call and you know want to get a message to your primary care provider, one of the nurses may take your call and have that conversation and get back to you. So I think you know, we have multiple ways to get messages to your provider, um, including Gateway, including a phone call with the nurse. And you know our primary care providers also keep a couple of open appointments on their schedule so that if they have someone from their panel who needs to see a, um, a provider and would prefer to see their own provider, we have that opportunity available. So um, I think we're pretty lucky. And so I think, Molly, did you want to do some questions? Okay. <laughs> Went through the gateway, I got an appointment with a doctor in 40 minutes, took a picture of the wound, we had a fabulous chat, and he treated me, and I didn't have to go to the emergency room, I didn't have to go through any contortions, and I was absolutely positively thrilled. That's, that's a, yes, thank you. Yeah, that's a great, comment and I think it also sort of calls to mind that through the gateway there is the opportunity to do um, a virtual appointment on demand and they're available from 7 in the morning till 11 at night through Mass General Brigham so that's bravo that's yes and weekends that's right 
That's right. Fantastic. So you all, you all are very impressive ladies, nurse, practice, nurse practitioners. Um, if I'm on the island and I don't have a doctor and I'm sick or I need to see a clinician, how do I get, how, what do I do? Do I call the hospital? How do I get a hold of one of you? Um, or so I, th I think if you've been coming here for years and you have not established with a primary care practitioner, it's something to consider. If you like using your primary care practitioner back home, that's perfectly appropriate. You could certainly call that individual and, and ask for advice, or you could make an appointment with the urgent care access. So that's how you start, that's, urgent care. Mm -hmm. That's where I would start. There, there is a dynamic, though, where I have a number of patients who are just regular seasonal residents, and they establish care. And it might not mean that I'm their primary, primary care provider, <laughs> but it might mean that they are known and they are known to us and we can kind of ask the history questions and we can ask family history, we can ask the risk questions, we can make sure that we're doing what we can. And then you do have that kind of direct connection and it does facilitate some things, especially if you know you have chronic disease. Like I have several patients for whom I've arranged to get infusions for things that they need when they're here. And so, those types of things wouldn't be ideal to be seen in urgent access. That would be ideal to kind of have someone who they might not be, like I said, your primary primary care provider, but they might be sort of a secondary set of primary care eyes to do some of those primary care things while you're here. Do we have a question? Yeah, <laughs> Thank you very much. So you can take advantage of the gateway and all these other things. If you yes. When you're feeling great. Yes. And I think did I see the the rat cards? That's information on on the virtual access on demand. So um, I think Molly, is that time? Thank you all so much. Part of the reason that I came to Nantucket was because of the people, the community, but also the people that I would be working with every single day. There is such an incredible amount of knowledge in this group and in the rest of our providers and staff. It is incredibly impressive. And the fact that we have our affiliation with Mass General, that just widens our horizons so big. And it gives us a safety net that we wouldn't normally have. And we are working really hard at expanding those services on island that we can do very, very well. If we can't do it very well, we're gonna figure out how to get those partnerships so that the person or that group can do it very well. And we are supporting our community. So we're very excited about this. We're very excited that you're here today and listening and asking questions and being engaged. And we hope that if there ever is a problem, you reach out and let us know that too so that we can fix it. So again, Thank you, thank Lisa, thank our team, and thank you.